have dedicated my 20s to journeying alongside young people in youth development centres across the country. But the high school is where the overwhelming majority of our young people spend most of their time. And yet school is often a catalyst for stress and anxiety. And too often, young people are seen as the recipients of education rather than active agents in their own learning journey. At Zeal, a youth development centre where I spend most of my time, while we support young people to dream and prepare for their future just as a school does, we also respond to who they are right then and there, who they are in the moment, with their inherent strengths as well as their struggles. And we say to each young person, you are already enough and we will help you see that for yourself. Zeal creates communities of belonging and creativity, supporting young people to find and shape a healthy identity and to believe that they are someone of worth. Belonging is about young people feeling cared for and supported in community. Creativity is about young people knowing that they have a voice and sharing that voice in a way that is natural and meaningful for them. Identity is about young people knowing where they're from, who they are, and who they want to be. And worth is about young people understanding that they have innate value that cannot be lost or taken from them. Now, while a young person may be seeing different counsellors, social workers, teachers, and sometimes even whānau or family, we aim to be the alongsiders. We aim to be the consistent adult presence in a young person's life. This kind of relationship truly captures the kaupapa or the ethos of youth development. It's about leading without directing and supporting without carrying. Our young people feel more isolated, stressed, and anxious than ever before. So these relationships are vital to the development of young people in Aotearoa, New Zealand. When you look at the stats, you see that we have the highest youth suicide rate in the whole of the OECD. It's a statistic that we hear year and year again, but we're almost comfortable with it. Yet it's a crisis. In our digital age, human connection becomes more vital, more important. And young people need to be connected with someone who will be content in just being present. Someone who will be happy to sit there and play Xbox with them. Someone who will be happy to go along to their soccer match or theatre performance. Someone who will sit there and learn about a topic that they're not necessarily interested in simply because the young person in front of them is all about it. But too often we think that youth development only lies in the in-depth discussions. Or we feel like we're not making a difference unless we knee deep in a young person's distress. For teachers, they're not seen as making a difference unless a young person's grades go up. But the biggest and most meaningful difference that I've seen has been in the time taken day by day to listen and learn about the young people in front of us. It has been in the purposeful sharing of lives. As youth workers, we must rely on the strength of our relationships in order to encourage, to challenge, to question, to teach. But teachers are expected to do this from day one. In youth development, time is a resource best spent in the presence of others. And our teachers also need to be given that space to truly build a human connection with the young people in their classrooms. Because chances are they're not getting that connection anywhere else. Not at home, not in their community, and certainly not online. In my time journeying alongside young people, I've heard many words used to describe them. Words like disconnected, problematic, criminal, and even scum of the earth. But in my privileged position in the lives of so many of our young people, I can safely say that if I had one word to describe them, it would be passionate. When you really think about it, when a young person finds that one thing that truly captivates them, their life becomes all about it. If it's gaming, they'll never leave their room. If it's guitar, they'll play it until their fingers bleed. If it's graffiti, you'll see their tag all over the street. And when young people fall in love, it's after the first day of dating. And when they break up a week later, their lives are completely over. I've been there a few times. <laughs> it's all because young people are deeply passionate with a huge sense of urgency. Young people are growth embodied, and our high schools urgently need to capture that passion and capture that growth instead of suppressing it and pushing it out of our young people. Youth development is tailored to meet the individual needs and wants of young people for collective good. And the high school needs to make room to do the same. Individual impact for collective good. Like a young person that I'll call Gigi. Gigi was a young person that I grew quite close to as a youth worker while I was down in Wellington, and she struggled heavily with anxiety. She spent most days in bed, unable to convince herself that life was worth getting out of bed for. 
She was missing school and failing all of her subjects. But after a while of coming along to Zeal's afternoon drop-in, she enrolled in our barista program. In her own words, this course gave her a reason to get out of bed every day, something to be passionate about, something that gave her a lot of confidence and took her out of this place of hopelessness and helplessness. Around this time, we had just launched um, our first social enterprise cafe made out of a shipping container on Lower Cuba Street in Wellington. Gigi impressed our manager so much that she was the first young person employed at Stories, this cafe. And soon after, we launched a second social enterprise cafe named after her and with her as the manager at just 18 years old. Imagine a high school where our teachers were freed up enough to provide that level of investment in the lives of individual young, young people to support them to believe in themselves and to contribute to collective good. Instead, our high school model is one that is highly competitive. Born in the 1980s, older than I am, probably some of you as well, that treats each school as an independent business competing in a market. Now, while this has produced some level of diversity to teaching approaches and has somewhat improved uh, community connectedness with their local schools, particularly in wealthy areas, the competitiveness has been transferred from the high schools to the individual young people themselves. And while this works for some students, it does not work for the majority, like a young person that I'll call YY. YY was brought into Zeal at age 13 by the scruff of his neck by a police officer, who basically threw him at us, said, he's your problem now, and left. YY would come up to Zeal each afternoon, and I quickly found out it's because school wasn't safe for him and home wasn't safe for him. Over time, we developed quite a close connection, and he would talk to me about his passion for hip-hop dance and his love of computer games. But unfortunately, his school life wasn't as captivating as his interests. He struggled with his all-too-frequent assessments and received little help from his overworked teachers, who each had 30 other students competing for their time. School became such a place of stress that at age 14, he dropped out altogether. And over time, it's meant that he's also stopped coming along to Zeal. The last I've heard of him, he was rolling around in a gang, a place of belonging that took him as he was, but asks him to be someone different in order to keep that belonging. And this is the true cost of our education system. The lives and future direction of our young people are in the hands of our teachers. But their hands are often too full with paperwork or bureaucracy to be able to extend a hand of welcome to the young person in front of them. And this needs to change. The benefits of our 30-year-old model have achieved all that they can, and so it's crucial that we take a hard look at the system. Even our assessment framework, NCEA, was created to be a fluid and dynamic assessment approach that would enable each young person to choose subjects that they were most interested in and be assessed in ways that they felt most comfortable with. But it's stuck in this rigid schooling system that treats each and every young person exactly the same and expects the same results from every one of them. We need high schools that instead respond to the individuals, the individual passions, the individual love of what they do. Inside an education system that believes in every single one of our young people and will stop at nothing to see each and every one of them succeed. Now, I spend a lot of time thinking about education reform, and when I do, it's so easy to look at other countries around the world to see what they're doing, to learn from them. So let's go where every single conversation about educational improvement ends up, or starts, Finland. Instead of the competition, stress, and standardized testing that we find in New Zealand high schools, Finnish classrooms are filled with warmth, collaboration, and are led by highly professionalized teachers, who are each given the freedom to innovate in order to best reach the young people in their classrooms. This model comes from a love of children and adolescence, a deep understanding of how children learn best, and a true respect and trust for teachers to do the right thing. Now, Finland has a long history of achieving educational excellence and equity for their young people. But I'm a firm believer that the answer to New Zealand's educational woes lie here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We are a unique country with unique educational challenges that cannot be solved by simply adopting another overseas model and dropping it into our system. The population of Finland, for example, is 90% Finnish. Young people in Finland are, for the most part, taught within their own cultural context, and teachers are given the freedom to innovate in order to reach the other 10% of young people. New Zealand's population is much more diverse. We're made up of about 15% Māori, 
We have a large New Zealand, European or Pākehā population, and we have an ever-growing population of Kiwis who are moving here from overseas. New Zealand has a much harder challenge in educating each of our young people within their own cultural context, particularly our whānau who have migrated here from overseas, like a young person that I'll call JJ. JJ first moved here from Taiwan when he was eight years old. And by the time he got to high school, found it to be an incredibly hostile and stressful environment. It seemed as though his understanding of culture, his understanding of who it was to be him, was so different to that of the people around him. He no longer felt like a citizen of Taiwan, but he didn't feel like a New Zealander either. And over time, this developed into a heavy anxiety until finally, in year 13, he dropped out of school and started homeschooling because he couldn't handle the hostility and the stress that brought about his anxiety. He first found out about Zeal when his homeschooling provider brought him and a few other students into our space to record the NCA music internals. He was also an avid photographer and so enrolled in our photography program. But JJ would struggle sometimes to even enter the Zeal building. He'd be stuck outside the front doors having a panic attack. The hostility from his high school had encroached on his personal life so much that he couldn't even engage in what he was passionate about. But soon enough, with encouragement from our youth workers, he began coming along to his course. He excelled. He had his work shown in an exhibition in town. And he was thrilled. He, he, he once told me that often he looks back and feels a little bit annoyed that he didn't find out about Zeal sooner because it became such a home and sanctuary for him and young people like him who didn't feel like they fit in at high school. Now, once JJ had finished his photography course, he started coming along to our all-ages events and took photos um, throughout the night. We were then really surprised to find him on stage performing his music in front of crowds. That anxiety when he was surrounded by people that he knew loved and cared about him and who supported him was non-existent. And JJ once told me something else about Zeal as well. He said, every time I walk up the steps of this place, I feel more at home. Imagine an approach to teaching our nation's young people in all their diversity that enabled each and every one of them to say, every time I walk through the gates of this school, I feel more at home. Our distinct cultural context needs a distinct educational model, one that enables our young people to understand themselves, to understand their culture, to live out of that, and to learn how to give back to the community around them. Our young Māori, for example, need an education that not only enables them to thrive in our mainstream society, but also to thrive as Māori, to uplift their community and support their whānau in improving their well-being and wellness. Many Māori immersion and kaupapa Māori high schools are now bringing together uh, approaches to teaching and learning tailored specifically to young Māori. Hamilton is home to a couple of these high schools and here they are achieving some of the highest NCA results in the whole of the Waikato region. There are a number of reasons for this uh, success, but one of which is assigning a mentor to smaller groups of 12 students to act as a bridge between the young people in the school and their whānau. Kura Kaupapa Māori are an innovative and important development in our education system and argue for the relationship first approach that our young people urgently need. I often wonder what YY would be up to now if his school had the capacity to respond to his cultural identity to help him to see the strengths in his culture instead of perceiving it as a deficit. We need to rethink what the purpose of education really is. Is it simply to teach young people how to pass exams and then to push them out into society and then ask them to contribute? Or is the purpose of education to support young people to develop their skills, knowledge, and their sense of self, to develop them and support them to give back to their community while they are still at school so that long term they know how to do this for the rest of their life. To make a change, we need to rehumanize our education system. Belonging, creativity, identity, and worth. That is what is missing from our high schools. That is how we rehumanize our education system. And that is how we support young people to take an active role in their learning journeys. Thank you.